Hey guys, Claire here, and in today's video, we're going to talk about all things Harry and Meghan. After the excitement of Harry and Meghan's three-day trip to Canada, I assumed that the following week would be quiet. And boy, was I wrong. Let's get into it. While the royal trolls and UK tabloids were pissed that Harry and Meghan were serenaded by Michael Bublé, or the fact that Harry and Meghan were embraced by spaces and members of the Commonwealth in ways that William and Kate just have not been welcomed, the House of Sussex has had an interesting and busy week. A recently released interview of the COO, Robin McVicker of the Invictus Games 2025, explains in details Prince Harry's vision for the games and his strong desire to include and work with the indigenous community. Can we talk about Prince Harry for a second? Because I know the athletes are the stars, but here is someone who is known around the world uh, and his wife, Megan, as well. What did they bring to it? How much of the heart of Invictus is built kind of around Harry's vision? It's Harry's heart. Yeah. The heart of Invictus is, is the Duke's heart. Um, and I, I got to see that. I mean, I, I didn't know what to expect when I came into this. I was really excited um, about the job, yeah. but I didn't know where the, the Duke would be and where he would play. I didn't know the patron. Um, we what we got to experience so in November in that secret surprise yeah. experience he came out and he wanted to sit with my team and go through every operating plan we tromped him through all of the mountains all of the venues and he sat down and he just talked to us about his vision how the most important thing we do is the competitor and are the family and friends and in Canada he is so concerned about how we link the indigenous connection. Nice. Because this was the first time ever that an organizing federation, so the Invictus Games Foundation internationally, actually said at the welcome and with the support of the four host nations on who these lands will be operated, that was the invitation for the Duke to come and invite the games here. Love it. So they've been connected in since the very beginning, Lillooet, Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh. Each of the chiefs had been on, involved there on our board. Um, we had artists from each of the nations collaborate together on what that visual identity would be. And what they all see is that there's such a link between the recovery and the reconciliation that mm. needs to happen in each of these communities, mm -hmm. that there's common language being spoken. Yeah. And yeah. that's where that connection comes from. ABC also aired a segment about Prince Harry and the Invictus Games. In 2017, the game's taking place in Toronto. A special one for Harry. It was where he and Meghan made their public debut, followed by Sydney, The Hague, Dusseldorf. I'd seen firsthand the transformative power of sport in helping people physically and psychologically recover and knew that the Invictus Games would change lives, capture hearts and inspire a generation. When you see Prince Harry advocating for interacting with the military community at events like Invictus, he is absolutely in his element. You can tell that that's when he's at his best. It's an environment where he finds people deal with him on the level. He, he doesn't have to be a prince. He can just be uh, an officer and, and, and Harry. The Invictus is Harry's number one passion project. It's been very successful since its outset. It doesn't come cheap. It costs a lot of money and he's been able to continue to raise that money throughout this period, which is impressive. But I think there was a degree of jealousy about how well it had gone. I do think that William was surprised how much this had been such a success and how, many, how much money was being thrown into it and how many governments were getting involved. Harry is no longer a working royal. Invictus no longer sits under the umbrella of organisations that the royal family officially are part of and therefore they haven't mentioned it at all since Harry stepped back as a worker. This week, just about every PR move that Prince William has made has been met with pushbacks. And it's interesting that Robert Jobson, a known Harry and Meghan critic, would go on American media and name drop William as someone being surprised at just how well Harry and the games have been able to thrive outside of the royal fold. Interesting. But we'll get to William and his PR faux pas later on in the video. We saw Meghan out and about having lunch, not once, but twice. The first outing was in Beverly Hills, lunch with her friend and designer of her wedding dress. Megan's most recent sightings and the woman that she's been dining with has had some royal watchers speculating. 
could these interactions have some sort of connection to Meghan's latest partnership with Lemonada? Only time will tell. Meghan Markle was papped in Los Angeles not just once, but twice yesterday. So here's what was up with these appearances and what I think she might be telling us. First, Megan was spotted grabbing lunch in Beverly Hills and she was accompanied by Claire Waite Keller. Claire is the former creative director of Givenchy and notably she is the person who designed Megan's wedding dress. Megan's early days as a working royal were filled with outfits designed by the label and she presented Claire Waite Keller with the Women's Wear Designer of the Year Award at the British Fashion Awards in 2018. So I think it's safe to say these two have a really good working relationship and they are close friends. I would kill to know if this was a working lunch or just them catching up. Because Claire Waite Keller actually has a fashion line with Uniqlo right now. It debuted last fall and the spring summer collection comes out in April. I can 100% see some of these outfits or pieces on Megan, especially if she's going to be out and about more this spring. I mean, the camel coat, hello. The understated luxury vibe was also in her outfit for this lunch, paired navy with a camel coat and some aquazura flats. Is it basic? Yes. Is it boring? No. Is it absolutely Megan? A hundred percent. She was also very clearly in her own skin later that day when she grabbed dinner in Studio City. On this outing, Megan was accompanied by Terry Wood, who is the executive VP of Oprah's production company. Obviously, the Meghan Markle Oprah connection needs no explaining. But Harpo Productions did help work on Megan's original podcast archetypes. Is this a working dinner? And were they discussing Megan's new podcasting deal with Lemonada Media? This was launched a little less than two weeks ago when the Sussex.com news was breaking. A separate umbrella company, Archwell Productions, has now kind of taken center stage. And Megan will be producing and distributing a brand new, as of yet untitled podcast, I think very soon. Here's why I think that. The Sussexes tend to do appearances like in batches. The couple will tend to do appearances that fall within a week or two, maybe three if we're pushing it. But I'm thinking back to the first time we saw Megan this year, which was a month ago already. January 23rd for the Bob Marley biopic premiere in Jamaica. The timeline here is way longer than what we usually get in terms of Harry and Meghan appearances. I think she's going to be back outside on a little bit more of a regular basis from here on out. But also hopefully this means that we are going to see some movement on her project very soon. I don't think that especially with her new representation with WME that the announcement about the new podcast would have been made if we weren't going to see some progress on it quickly or quickly than we did with the Sussex's Spotify deal. I think some lessons were learned there. The looks from yesterday too are telling me that Megan is doing this on her own terms. These outfits are not, you know, overly formal. This one, I mean, it's jeans for crying out loud. She's clearly in her own skin. She's comfortable and I absolutely love that for her and her journey and I can't wait to see what comes next. We also learned a little bit more about the young entrepreneur who is backed by Harry and Meghan for her free anti-cyberbullying app. A couple months back in 2023, we saw Meghan and Harry call the Youth Power Fund recipients. This young lady was one of the recipients and we saw her in that video. So it's been wonderful to see how this has progressed. Meghan also made a touching tribute in honor of her late friend. And for those of you who don't know, during Meghan's time as a senior working royal, she was the patron of a Hugh. When it was announced that Meghan's friend Ollie had passed, we had learned that Meghan had made some sort of contribution to Mayhew, but now we know that Meghan's generous contribution has led to the opening of this wing for Mayhew. So that's really nice. Now, while Harry and Meghan have been enjoying some PR wins and just being booked, busy, and unbothered, Prince William has been out and about doing his PR lap. But I'm not entirely sure that the result of his two PR pushes this week went the way he anticipated. Prince William is back on his life's mission to bring peace to the Middle East. I don't know how he thinks he's going to achieve that. He's president of the FA and can't even attend a World Cup final that England are in. And he's president of the British Academy of Film and Television Arts Awards, but hasn't got time to watch a film. He's wading into the conflict in the Middle East, and he can't even solve the conflict in his own family. To be fair, he is going to devote more time to the Middle East by listening to people talking about it. For two hours, apparently. But after he messed up at the BAFTAs, I think it's best that he does just listen. 
Second weird story from the Daily Mail that appears to be briefing about against, sorry, not about, against Catherine and William. Well, not Catherine, because no one's seen her since Boxing Day. Um, loads of rumours on TikTok, even in the sensible corners. God knows where she is. William, again, unable to converse with people in a normal human manner at the BAFTAs. Loads of time on his hands. Hasn't seemingly watched anything on Netflix, even though he's got 60 staff and does literally one engagement, which is three hours long every 10 days. Why couldn't he just make the effort to understand how these actors um, prepared, what roles they were in, what did they do, notable scenes, um, things to avoid, massive gaff here. Back to the gift that keeps on giving the Daily Mail and Kensington Palace's briefing and video content to the Daily Mail about Prince William and his two-hour visit, two-hour visit to the British Red Cross, a UK charity which is literally a 10-minute drive from his house. Is this guy ever going to get out of London and do something somewhere else? Who the heck knows? And where is Kate? I know I keep saying it, but where is she? Why can't she do a little video message just telling us all, hey, I'm okay? Harry and Meghan, three days in Victor's Games. Prince William, two hours, British Red Cross. The best he can do is talk to people having a sandwich at lunchtime and say that sometimes you want a burger. Is this the best that the British royal family can do? Seriously. I mean... Why was he there? What was the objective? Was his objective to increase the amount of donations to the British Red Cross? Well, why haven't we got some video content of him talking about that? Was his objective to raise awareness of the number of natural disasters across the world from climate change? I don't know. Why haven't we got some video content about that? What are his advisors doing? I think they're throwing him under a bus. I think gen genuinely... They're trying to make him look like a detached, moronic, out-of-touch person. Now remember, earlier in the video, we saw a clip of Robert Jobson saying that William, in particular, thought that Harry's Invictus Games would suffer immensely uh, without the backing of the royal establishment. Then we saw the other lady in the interview say that because Harry is no longer a working royal, the royal family does not mention Invictus Games at all. Which to me is extremely bitter and petty, but it's the House of Windsor for you. Then we've seen a lot of conversations surrounding the topic of what truly has been a motivating factor for William as of late. And a lot of people are drawing the conclusion that William is heavily motivated by competing with Harry. Now, a lot of us who've paid attention to this, this is not surprising. We've been saying this for a while now, but it's interesting to see that it's been the topic of conversation for the past week. Fresh off a very successful trip to Canada, Harry and Meghan have been enjoying really good PR. William decides to go to the BAFTAs. The BAFTAs, which he rarely attends. A palace source said that this was a last minute decision, which basically lets us know that, yeah, we're right. He's in competition. Harry has good press. William needs to get out there and make sure he gets good press. He goes there, ill prepared. But even before that, when you see him walking the red carpet or the video of him entering um, where the BAFTAs was held, there wasn't any like chairs. I thought that people would be a lot more excited to see him. A lot of people took notice and went about their conversations. Some look less than enthused, but overall there were no fanfare for the future King of England, who the tabloids and royal reporters love to tell us is the most popular royal, or at least far more popular than his brother. And if that wasn't enough, William soon saw fit to add commentary about what's going on in casa. And this is where you've seen a lot of the members of the British press being very angry with William and openly calling out William's one-sided competition with Harry. And that is what I find interesting. Not one, not two, not three, several of these media commentators who for the past few years 
were 100% Team William, at least as it relates to Harry and Meghan. So I'm wondering, is this the era where William will be held accountable in the media in a way that he used to be held accountable before Meghan came onto the scene? When Meghan came into the family, she became the perfect scapegoat. And try as hard as they might, and Lord knows they're still trying, they have not been able to destroy Harry and Meghan's spirit, destroy their business opportunities, or destroy their marriage. So, perhaps in frustration, they'll look elsewhere. And William, who is attempting to fight this PR battle with Harry, is right on up there for the picking. Only time will tell to see something so sort of politically forthright from the royals. Why do you think he's done this? I think he's, again, pursuing his own agenda here and he's trying to reach out to the um, politically very emotive millennial generation. And he's trying to outsmart his brother, I suspect. That's a bit of what's going on here. I am a monarchist. I, I, I support the idea of the monarchy, but I am uncomfortable with this. And uh, I can see that uh, the, the wording has been very careful to be um, uh, not, neither one side nor the other. But even platitudes can be flammable. And uh, the, the timing of this is stinks to me. First of all, with, the, with the, what's going on at Westminster, for goodness sake, if you're heir to the throne, you don't, uh, you don't sound off about some, uh, uh, a topic that's about to be discussed uh, in Parliament. It strikes me as a rather naive, uh, bland statement, which could well backfire on them. The whole point of a monarchy how, how is to backfire? be silent. You've got to be as silent as Charlie Chaplin in one of his early films. And doing something like that, he's just trying to say, I'm here, I matter, I don't want the heir to the throne to be doing that. So why do you think it might backfire? Because once he's done that, next time there's a, a difficult political situation... there'll be an expectation that he say, says why hasn't again. the Prince of Wales sounded off? You know, we want to hear what Prince William thinks. We don't. We don't you, want I, to hear what he thinks. I, I, I it doesn't what, matter what he thinks. He's a figurehead. I tell you, I do agree with you. Why do you think he made that statement? Because, and I'm not saying this means he's wrong or this opinion is wrong, because it's the fashionable opinion. Uh, it's what everybody on social media is saying. It's what people around William will be saying. And I think this is something we have to be a little bit wary of with William, uh, as he probably becomes monarch quite soon, uh, is um, that he has uh, a tendency, because he's so worried about his brother, uh, to want to sort of be to outwoke Harry, as it were, to be more on the side of fashionable opinion than Harry. Um, and this is a very cynical take, but I only say this because I thought the last line of his statement was ridiculous. OK, so I'm going to try not to beat a dead horse. I know we have all seen this at this point. I just want to say a few things quickly. I think that this incident, along with many others, continues to prove that William is not ready for prime time. He is not ready to be in the driver's seat no matter how much he wants it, because there's no way that this should have ever happened. Like, this man is cartoonishly bad at dealing with people who are not there to kiss his behind and are Aristos. He has no idea how to interact with people. And if I'm being honest, I think that a lot of us probably feel the same way. This only happened because of the amazing week that Harry had, the amazing coverage around Invictus. I mean, even American media defended Harry against the UK media when they were being utterly ridiculous. The fact that Michael Blue like, <laughs> you know, it was funny, but like serenaded Harry shows that he's loved around the world, appreciated around the world. And I know that just burned Williams behind. So he shows up at the BAFTAs thinking, well, I'm president, okay? I'm the one in power and control here. So people are gonna fawn all over me and I'm also gonna get amazing coverage. But because I do believe that William probably has a smooth brain, that he didn't realize that the things that he was saying is off-putting because he doesn't know how to talk to people because he doesn't want to know how to talk to people now listen i have seen very legitimate critiques that why did he watch the movies before he got there why didn't he read his briefings why did he even read a synopsis of these movies and i think those are all fair critiques but if i'm being honest he needs to do all that i mean he really didn't as long as you don't have to be the most important person in the room, as long as you don't have to be the one always talking, this is this is a situation that is so easy to navigate. He could have congratulated them for their win, asked them about how they liked making the movie, what was their favorite part, their least favorite part, what did they do to get into character. He could have given the mic essentially over to them, let them talk about their experiences, let them enjoy their win, and everybody would have walked away with a positive interaction. 
And even if someone would have said, oh, well, have you watched this movie? It would have been very easy to be like, you know what? With everything going on, I haven't had a chance to watch it just yet. But me and Catherine plan on having a movie night here soon. Boom. Done. Perfect. Situation, like, or crisis averted. I think that William is really just now starting to understand that being king isn't a flex. It's just a title. It means nothing. You have no legislative power. You have no social power. You have no political power. You're not taken seriously when you are in the room with world leaders. They're not looking to you for direction. You're a figurehead. You know, essentially, you're a giant white elephant gift that nobody asked for. And I think that he's just now really starting to understand this. And you know that a lot of those people, especially Aristos, feel the same way. Because one, Charles got bullied when he was a kid. And that makes absolutely no sense. I mean, legitimately makes no sense. What do you mean the future king of England was bullied? Two, no one wanted to marry um, William or Harry, for real, for real. Now, don't y'all come for me because I love me some Harry. But like... The fact that clearly the paparazzi was absolutely bonkers, and I think that's what really um, hurt Harry's chances of finding somebody, you would think that available princes would have had women throwing themselves at them to be a princess, and it didn't happen. Why? Because no one cares. <laughs> like, nobody cares about the title. But I think that for William, he coasted for so long. He coasted for so long, y'all. Like, think about it. When he was younger, you know what I'm saying? He was cute by their standards, but like he coasted on his looks. Princess Diana, you know what I'm saying? Her life was taken. So everybody felt really sorry for him and, and Harry. So he, he continued to like coast, right? People were focusing more on like Diana and Charles and all of the nonsense. And then they used Harry as a scapegoat while William just did whatever he wanted to do. William was also super problematic, but those type of things weren't reported or they were quickly swept underneath the rug. He then married Kate. Okay, everybody's like, oh my God, look, it's like a fairy tale wedding. Okay. But at the end of the day, like, he didn't really make a name for himself. He didn't do anything. And with clearly the split between, like, Harry and Meghan and the rest of the royal family, what we have seen now was when Harry left, Harry took the heart and soul out of that family with him when he left, okay? There is an obviously gaping hole in the British royal family. Queen Elizabeth is gone. There's no distraction. And everybody's looking and they're like uninterested in the working royals that are left behind. Nobody cares. No one cares. And William sees that. William sees that every breath his brother makes, somebody's recording it. Somebody's reporting on it. Even when he ain't doing nothing. This man can't go jogging without someone taking a picture and, you know what I'm saying, like writing an article. This man did Earthshot and he couldn't get people to pay attention to it. I think that he's desperately looking for something to make his name a name for himself. But because he's so disingenuous as a human being and he only really wants the the accolades, the respect, the the, the adoration, um, because that's what he, his goal is, it doesn't land the same. It just doesn't. And I think he's realizing, and I think he's super ticked off, but he doesn't know how to change it. But I mean, honestly, it's his personality. I don't think it's something he can fix. But yeah, being king, queen, it's not a flex. It doesn't mean anything. If you have no power, what's the point? Prince William managed to drag himself away from his busy life looking after Princess Kate and the kids to attend his fourth event of the year as a paid-up royal. Imagine if throughout the longest month of the year, January, and most of February, he only had to turn up to work four times, and even then not for full days, and you get paid almost two million for doing it. It's so tough for him, but he soldiered on alone. Oh yeah, we still haven't seen or heard from Kate, have we? Maybe she's enjoying some time on her own. You'd have thought that being the president of the British Academy of Film and Television Arts Awards, that he might have watched something. You know like a film that's been nominated. But no, he bowls in with no knowledge. So I didn't really have intentions of talking about Prince William being at the Baptist yesterday because, I mean, everyone's gonna ignore the whole point that he can go to awards shows while his father has cancer and his wife is at home recovering from surgery while his brother cannot. And the fact that he showed up wearing a velvet suit jacket again because that's his new safety blanket. 
until Prince Drake happened to point out a very fascinating article that the Daily Mail and other publications have written about now, which was an awkward exchange that Prince William had with the winner of the movie How to Have Sex, which entails a woman traveling through Europe and ends up being R-worded. The actress said that she hoped the film would improve society's conversations we have around consent and help people talk about situations that they've been through. When William met with the women, he greeted them by saying, I haven't watched your film. I think it looked like you had a lot of fun all the way through. I, I think this woman here speaks for all of us and I'm, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> Are you telling me that nobody could have briefed this man on the synopsis of the movie? Did he pay attention to the award speech? In the mother of all things tone deaf, I do believe Prince William's picture is going to have to go next to the definition now. Holy cow. <laughs> I'm sure there's going to be arguments about what Prince William even could have said because they're apolitical figures and making comments would have been political. But given that roughly 85,000 women in the UK are SA'd every single year, it would not have been a stretch for William to acknowledge that a movie like this, the significance this can have for women, or acknowledge its impact it can have on society as a whole, was a missed opportunity. This actually made me laugh for all the people wanting Meghan and Harry to lose their titles. You know what will happen, right? If they did, which is not going to happen. But this is what will happen. I'm going to go in between them. Stripping Harry and Meghan of their titles would only make matters worse. Derived of the Duke Dukedom of Sussex, the couple would become Prince and Princess Harry, or Henry, really, which would actually elevate their brand. <laughs> oh, I actually would like them to go through all of that and then people to get angry about, oh my God, She's now officially a princess. <laughs> they would go mental, wouldn't they? <laughs> the article continues rather bitterly. He's dynamite, but not of the right kind. Besides, he and William would be the brothers grim. Nevertheless, those calling for Harry and Meghan to be stripped of their titles are missing the point and risk a head-on collision with Cape Counterproductive. <laughs> Derived of the Dukedom of Sussex, the couple would become more elevated still as they would revert to being Prince Harry and Princess Harry, titles that could never be removed as they are part of the prince's inalienable birthright and a prince always trumps a duke, due in part to the scarcity of such handles. Ah. The crazy land of TikTok, we all know normally there's two sides. There's the Meghan and Harry side and there's the William and Kate side. I try and be in the middle, it's difficult, but I just want to have a look at this. I can't get it as my background because TikTok apps are being an absolute pain today. Just want to talk about this. We know Megan absolutely loves animals, right? She's had two rescue dogs and putting a lot of effort in here. I've got to say for her, putting a lot of effort in for charity with a time difference, doing something for them for no money and to raise their profile so they can do more good things for dogs and we all love dogs right if you don't love dogs there's probably something wrong with you hats off to megan i was actually also going to use a um, an image of a yesterday i think taken by the daily mail where she looked fantastic and um, when she went out for lunch but i'm not going to do that because i'm not going to objectify her as a woman and comment on her looks i'm just going to focus on the good things she does for no pay and probably no thanks. Royal family in the UK, you could learn a lot from this. Why does it look like he's singing for them? They all look like, oh man, I thought that the other white prince boy was gonna be here. They do not look impressed. <laughs> She's so me. We are the same. We cannot control our face. <laughs> There's a reason that she's the Irish princess for a reason. And we love her. We love her. Um, please never change. This photo of Io Dibbery meeting Prince William in my soul, in my spirit, in my heart of heart. Because every black person and or every woman, really every minority has been right here, has experienced a situation. Dinner party, at a club, at a bar, near or far. 
It's universal, dare I say. It's when a straight man is telling you a story and he really thinks he's killing it. He thinks that you are invested with every fiber of your being. A story about how he like won a game of darts or chugged a beer faster than his brother or that Beyonce told him he was a fantastic dancer. What he does not get is that everyone is trying to physically and emotionally escape the situation as fast as humanly possible. These are the faces of people looking for an exit. These women are using Morse code to call 911 with their eyelids. I've never been more sure of anything. Which brings me back to my political platform of 2024, which is stop straight men from doing things. Telling stories, owning pets, speaking in public. All of it must come to a close if we are to have a functional society going forward. This message brought to you by the Fund for Iowa Dibbery's Freedom and Elbow Length Cocktail Gloves. Yeah, I, uh, I'm just, I don't know. I don't understand. Um how this happened. <laughs>